Hey everyone, I wanted to let you know that this week's episode has a really cool kind of special feature where there's a bonus episode that uh, you can only get access to if you are a Patreon member of Drum History. So if you're interested in getting that bonus episode, which is about 40 minutes of Vincent and I talking about more 5000 stuff, um, some cool stories and additional information, you can head to drumhistorypodcast.com and click the Patreon link and it'll take you there and it's as cheap as two bucks a month, and you get this special episode, and we'll be doing more of these in the future with future guests. So, um, yeah, enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my good friend, Vincent Ward of Vitalizer Drums. Vincent, welcome to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, it's awesome to have you back because uh, I, I I say that I'm fr- I, I am friends with everyone who comes on the show, um, but you and I actually are friends, and we've you yeah. know shared a booth at the Chicago show, and um, and I have just like bounced a lot of ideas off of you as because you're a really good listener of the show, which I love. But I'll, I'll say, hey, what do you think about this? And then you're you're kind of an honest opinion, so it's it's awesome to have you back. You were first on episode five about Speed Kings, and now you're back, which is great. Yeah, th- uh, thank you for, I know a lot of people say this, but thank you for doing the podcast. It's really, if you're a person who has any kind of uh, downtime driving or working, it's it's really nice to have podcasts and it's really cool to listen to stuff that is in, um, you know, your chosen subject. For sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, um, so today we're talking about the uh, the 5000 pedal, which maybe people know it as the DW 5000 pedal, but that's there's a long history behind it. But first, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll hop into um, the, the topic today. But uh, yeah, tell us about you. Okay. Um, I am a professional restorer and collector of vintage bass drum pedals uh, with emphasis on restoring them so they're playable while maintaining the historical accuracy and originality of the pedal. So uh, for the last five years, I've o- operated a business called Vitalizer Drums, which does high-level mechanical and cosmetic restorations, um, primarily for vintage bass drum pedals, but also um, hi-hats and other hardware as well, currently by special requests only, um, just due to the, the workload. But during the time period of operating the business, I became a personal collector as well, um, just through getting things that I I became interested in before I knew it, I had a personal collection (laughs) that's now uh, fairly large, but um, restoring pedals is really fun. A lot of people do it themselves. Um, It's very gratifying and there's a big payoff um, in that if you succeed, you get a playable pedal. A lot of pedals, especially old pedals, they're not operational any longer, but they need something to make them, um, make them playable again. So that's, that's really fun to do. And, um, along the way you can learn about the history and the evolution of pedals themselves. Um, it's a relatively short history, you know, about, um, a hundred or 120 years total, but with the 5,000 pedals specifically, there's a really interesting history in that it dates back to before world war two and is currently still going on with DW pedals. Um, So I would consider myself in the early stages of researching 5,000 pedals, um, but I've definitely started to devote more time to them. Yeah, that's awesome. They, um, and you say you're in the early stages and and I I say this uh, in a great way. You're, you're very thorough. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> of going through and creating stuff, even because when, when we kind of started to get this idea together, I mean, you've been working on this outline. I'm sure you're not doing 12 hours a day, um, every <laughs> seven days a week on it. But like, but really, you put together a awesome outline here, um, which I will include on the drumhistorypodcast.com um, episode page for this. Anyway, you're very thorough, which I love, and very prepared. And um, and you. I'll tell people before we even get into it that the stuff you do with the Speed Kings and just the restorations are like awesome. I mean, it's just so cool for me to see like these classic pedals, which you know would really get rusted over and just kind of like nothing would happen with them. And you're making them basically new, um, which 
is really cool. Well, the 5,000 is, is specifically interesting for this specific purpose because you can get modern parts from DW that retrofit it. So that's cool. A, a problem with Speed King, for example, is the only parts for it that are really usable are all discontinued. The new Speed King, not all of the parts, not many of them are compatible with the old ones. So yeah. you're always trying to source parts, but with the 5000 pedal, you can source any part you need. And there's also, in addition, a lot of vintage parts available. So Sure, yeah. And that's how we, I know I said it on our episode, which was like 70 or 80 episodes ago, but yeah. um, I sold you some Speed King parts that I got uh, at a music auction I went to where I think I paid $10 and it was a um, little like, I shouldn't have told you that because I sold it to you, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was like a, a little box that was just full of old Speed King parts. And I think it was like one and a half quote unquote full pedals. And um, again, knowing that they, they came back to life with you is um, super cool. But um, anyway, without further ado, I think it's a good time to jump in now to the, the history um, of the 5000 pedal um, that we all know and love. I know I have an old one that is great. And then I have a newer double pedal that I can talk about more later because it actually broke and I had to get a new chain, which I think there's probably maybe something to, to, to talk about with that, with the quality and all that later. But um, so, uh, yeah, take it away. Cool. OK, so I'm, I'm going to preface this timeline um, by saying that the information presented here is to the best of my current knowledge. Um, some of the stuff from my speaking episode uh, did uh, change. <laughs> so um, yeah. th the information is always um, open to interpretation. I'm always glad to gain new information, even if it's contradictory to what I currently think. It's to me, there's no um, hubris in it. It's it's really just about figuring out the mystery. Because as you'll see, when we start, we're going to start before World War II, and that time period, there is no there's no firsthand accounts anymore. You have the items, but even those are are pretty rare. So sure. The history of 5000s starts and especially at the beginning, these are estimated dates because there's no literature during this time period for Martin Fleetfoot, which is the parent company, the company that designed, I wasn't able to find the exact patent, but somewhere in, in the patent database, you, you could find this. Um, but they had basically just two products that they that they made. It, se it seems like they probably just made these, um, these pedals, but the Martin Fleetfoot Company is, was based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, there's not a lot of definitive inf information about them because there's no known literature and mm -hmm. the pedals themselves are, are relatively rare. Um, so uh, the 5,000 pedal is with the hinged footboard and the 5001 is with the one piece footboard. Um, I just sort of assigned these, these numbers because that's what was used a little bit later by um, gotcha. Camco, but you'll see two different types. And um, it was probably developed before world war II and patented um, as ha has been discussed in many other episodes you've done. The, the whole world kind of stopped during world war II, especially for the countries more directly involved. So let's yeah. let's say that whoever designed it at Martin Fleetfoot, there there are pedals that I believe were made before the war because they say um, patent applied for instead of um, later where it would just where it would say patented or say nothing at all on the footboards. Um, yeah. So I think it, they were they were developed and patented. It may have been approved before the war or maybe afterwards, but um, the war happens, 1946 comes, and you are allowed to use metal again. And that's when the real history begins. So it's already been designed by Martin Fleetfoot. Um, and at this point, I think that they did all of the manufacturing as well. So of this time period, let's say, late 40s, early 50s, you see a lot of what I call stencil versions of the 5000 pedal. 
So you've got your Martin Fleet foot pedals, um, but you've also got Gretsch floating action, which Martin Fleet foot was making that for them. It's identical to their pedal, except the casting for the footboard is different. So that's what sort of tells me that the manufacturing, if pedals were manufactured in, in different places, there, there would be more differences. But if you put one yeah. next to the other, they're identical except for the branding. There's also two other extremely rare versions. People use rare and vintage drums in a very liberal way. Um, I've heard people <laughs> say that um, superphonics are rare. <laughs> um, <laughs> when there's like a million of them. Yeah. But there, there are stencil versions that say Power Sonic on them. I've only seen one. And Elite Toronto, which was probably in, in Canada, um, Again, I've only seen one, uh, but it's possible there there were others. But basically, you can imagine Martin Fleetfoot um, in Minneapolis, and they're making pedals for anyone who, who wants them. That was that was their business sure. model. Um, yeah, anything that is old um, and wasn't mass produced becomes truly rare, and by that mm-hmm. I mean. I've probably seen maybe 15 um, and I look for them um, ever. Yeah. I've seen 15. <laughs> There's certainly more. The, the thing is that it's a, it's a very interesting item to, to people. Um, a lot of guys have one on their shelf and they, you know, they wouldn't sell it because to them, sure. to them it's interesting even if they don't play it. Um, yeah. The one that I have, I, I have three of them currently. Um, which, of the Mart, you have three of the Martin Fleetfoot pedals. Yeah, that sounds kind of greedy that I have three out of fifteen <laughs> of the world's current population. But I, I am willi- good for you. I'm always willing to sell things. If you want one, contact me. Um, <laughs> two of them were broken when they came to me, um, and the way that they typically break is on the leather hinge. Um, so sure. ba- basically, what are those worth? I mean, what is the value of those? Not to like, I don't know if that's a um, rude question, but ah. Uh, I got mine for almost any pedal. If someone doesn't know what it is, you can get for about fifty dollars. That just wow. seems to be that. That seems to be pe- people's going rate of what they think a pedal is worth. Now, to me, what about like a pristine mint one that's like per- perfectly restored? Are those like you know, two hundred fifty is usually the cap of the market because um, the people yeah. who are willing to pay that much include myself. My friend Steve, who I mentioned last time, um, yes. I'll, I'll, yeah. tr- I'll try to give him some more shout outs um, later, but he is exactly like me in terms of the details. He wants everything to be correct. So if for some reason a, a new old stock or very lightly played Martin Fleetfoot came up, especially if it was pre-war, because that's extremely rare, um, I would pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> I'll yeah, just say that. Sure. Okay, so and I know we have to like move forward here, but can I ask you a couple quick questions that you can just rattle off the answers to? Sure. Well, first off, a comment. I like that it says patent applied for. That's just kind of like unique. It's like, hey, we applied for it. It doesn't mean we're going to get it. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's pending. It just I like how it says patent applied for. That's cool. And then just to um, clarify, the Martin Fleetfoot pedal is not, you did say this, it's not technically a 5000 or a 5001 pedal. Those are just so we can kind of like talk about it and put it into perspective. It's just known as like a Martin Fleetfoot pedal, right? Yeah, because there's no literature, you can't know. But sure. I, I think they probably did call it the, the 5000 because um, otherwise um, they were making pedals for Camco during this, peri- this period too. So, okay, yeah. And, and Gretsch was called something a little bit different. Um, so uh, hopefully the, the questions will be... Um, will be a- answered as, as we go through. I wanted to, qu- sure. to okay. quickly go over the basic features because they remain pretty constant all the way into today's pedals, which are obviously manufactured in, in a different way, um, in a different country with different materials, but the design remains the same. So you have um, cast aluminum components. Aluminum is a good lightweight metal that's also strong, um, and you can... You can reinforce it. It's um, definitely a good a good metal to start with. Um, it has a hex rocker rod, so because it's a hex, it can't 
rotate or loosen nearly as easily. Mm-hmm. It's a very solid way to connect it. Um, even the earliest ones have rocker rod um, bearings in there. So bearings are the critical aspect of any pedal design that make it play smoothly. Uh, the eccentric cam, that's what the, what the strap um, goes over. That's probably how they were awarded their first patent because that eccentric cam is unique enough over anything that came before it that it would warrant uh, being awarded the patent. But that also um, definitely affects the way that it, uh, the pedal feels. Uh, at the end of the cam, you have what's, what is referred to as a stroke regulator. Um, on later pedals, this is a four point where you can move the position of that into e- either of these points and it dramatically changes the, the feel of the pedal and also where the beater sits. Um, spring adjustment, um, pretty standard, uh, leather strap, and then the leather heel plate hinge is, is the last feature that was on Martin fleet foot pedals specifically. Cool. And now as you know, as we're doing the features, I'm wondering, um, obviously this pedal, the design has been around for like 80 years, if my math is correct. So yeah, my question is, is like, what was the predecessor to this like what pedals maybe like visually you can kind of describe what would people be using before this uh in like let's say the 30s i guess the speed king would be around right i mean yeah but is this pretty this was pretty revolutionary right i guess it kind of comes down to the question of like what makes the 5000 so such a game changer in general it was definitely revolutionary um as far as predecessor models Speed King is something completely different, and that's that's its own um, unique type of pedal with the compression yeah. springs. But um, so the original Ludwig pedal, uh, people always call them 1909 pedals, but that was really just when it was developed and patented. I've never actually seen one that's from 1909. I have some very early ones, and I know people have some very early ones. But let's say that it's 1910 or 1911. If you look at that design, it's not dissimilar from a 5000 and the the main feature of course is the extension spring but th- that's the archetype for all pedals after it everything goes everything kind of goes back to the original pedal and i'm sure there may have been uh influences on that pedal as well but there was also a pedal called the ludwig comet the comet pedal if if you look at it is a similar design it's got s- some similar features but yeah, definitely. With prior to that, the the cast pedals were a heavier material. I, I'm not exactly sure sure what it was, okay. but um, yeah, the five thousand by Martin Fleetfoot was definitely very revolutionary for his time. Got it. Okay, now we can stick to the uh, outline that you've uh, beautifully put together, and I'll stop uh, <laughs> derailing us. <laughs> oh no, that, that's okay. All right. Okay, carry on. So w- Martin Fleetfoot made pedals under their own brand. Uh, they also, at Gretsch and Camco were the, the biggest imprint brands. So Gretsch 5000 pedals actually span the entire range from 1946 to 1985 when the, their pedal lineup changed a little bit. But they called their pedal the 4955 Floating Action. And they had a, a, a lower priced model called the professional for uh, four nine five six, and um, Gretsch never owned any patent or tooling for this pedal. All the manufacturing was done by Martin Fleetfoot until it transferred, which we'll get into a little bit later. But um, you see a lot of Gretsch five thousand pedals because the design remains largely unchanged um, from nineteen forty six to nineteen sixty five when Camco makes some changes. Um, Gretsch's are primarily leather strap. There's some nylon strap examples from the mid sixties onwards. And, um, fast forwarding way into the early eighties as, uh, Gretsch also had a, a single chain turbo version of their pedal. Um, I've never seen a Gretsch one piece footboard. But um, I have seen Camco one-piece footboards from this time period. Um, 
There's also Gretsch yeah. pedals. There's one on Reverb right now that I've been trying not to buy. Um, there, there's there's <laughs> a Gretsch I'm, pedal I think I'm looking on, at it. on, Re- cool. on Reverb that has a leather hinge. So that was almost certainly made by Martin Fleetfoot um, prior to Camco. Gotcha. Yeah, and man, I mean, you just see that pedal board from a mile away and, and you know that like, it's just so iconic. It's like, I don't want to say it looks kind of like a fish, but you know what I mean? Like it has yeah. that design of like, well, it does look like a fish. Um, <laughs> it, it, um, it's very iconic and just, it's, it, it obviously caught on. And, and I, I would prefer the, the two piece with the, the, the disconnected, you know, the, the lower, the foot yeah. plate that's not, you know, cause that's just what reminds me of like a normal modern 5,000, but, uh, it's, it's cool. more, it's more versatile too. You have to like a one piece footboard where, uh, a hinged footboard is going to cater to everybody, in- including those, those people, everyone's able to, to play it without a feeling, um, strange. So, yeah. um, still in the, the late forties, early fifties time period, there are Camco pedals being made as well by Martin Fleetfoot. Um, and if you remember from the Camco episode, Camco didn't start making drums until the early 60s. In the 50s, they were George Way. So you see the George Way catalog, but also in a, a catalog that I just found recently through a, a friend, um, Camco did exist in the 50s. They just they sold mostly hardware and accessories and the 5000 pedal. Although, hmm. in my opinion, they weren't making it at this time. It seems almost impossible to to determine that. So there's um, some guesswork involved in that. Sure. But the Camco yeah. the Camco version is identical to the the Gretsch version and the Martin Fleetfoot version that were being produced at the same time. They're all all the same. So every so these would be created, like you said, in let's probably Minneapolis where Martin Fleetfoot was doing it. Yep. And then just kind of like the white label you know, stencil, they would just be stamped with Camco or George Way or whatever it would say um, and then be sent out, right? Yeah, the, the footboards were the only part that, that was, was different. So Gretsch probably had to invest in getting that, that die I made see. for their... And then the, the, the more obscure ones, like the Power Sonic and the Elite Toronto, they're much more simple. So that was a, may have been a more simple process of doing it. But um, so... Got it. The, the, the next era I would call the Camco era because in the, in the mid fifties, at some point between 1950 and 1960, this is estimated. Martin Fleetfoot decided to sell the patent, the manufacturing, the dyes, the tooling, everything. And Camco bought the, it's pretty, pretty well accepted that Camco probably took over everything at, at this point. They, they would have been well situated to to do so being a machine shop and with their Mm -hmm. with their existing um infrastructure so at this point martin retires we'll just call him martin since nobody knows who invented this pedal i was just gonna say is martin fleetfoot a person or do you think that's like a made up it can't be it's too good of a name to be real (laughs) (laughs) like John Baker and he's a baker kind of thing. Yeah. I mean it's it's yeah. a it's a cool name and and what's what's cool is that uh you know you're always going to be able to identify it because the the castings the castings uh last a really long time. So it it's yeah. it's cool that there's um there's another version of of the fleet foot which I I um it's a little different. There's they're like painted gold. I've seen ones that are painted green. I think it may have been some kind of international type thing. Um, I just wanted to throw that in there real quick. I didn't find yeah. enough definitive information, but I have seen them. There's pictures of them online. Uh, if you know something cool. about this, uh, contact me. Um, cool. Okay, so now we're in the Camco era, and this is when the pedal really comes into its own and actually starts being improved upon. So um, Camco has two models, the 5000, known as the Deluxe, and the 6000 known as the, as the standard. The only difference between the two is that the 6000 has a instead of having a hex rocker shaft, it has a circular rocker shaft with um kind of a cheaper system, but it's still it's still a strap. It doesn't have a cam, it just hooks onto like a little um 
a little like kind of Y uh, bolt thing. Um, and so you, you do see those for Camco and Gretsch. I've never seen a fleet foot one so that I'm ble- I'm led to believe that that's a Camco invention. Um, so they produced them for a while without changes. And then in the mid sixties, um, Maybe, you know, at, the, at this point, they're producing drums. They're a bigger company. They probably have bigger budgets. They have an R&D department, I'm sure. They start making changes. So the leather strap would stretch out. So they made a nylon strap, which turns out also stretches out. But at the time, they, they may have thought that it was um, better. And it probably was better in terms of long-term durability. Mm-hmm. Um, but... They also changed the rocker cam, so it's a pressed steel plate, chrome plated, instead of the the cast or machined aluminum piece. And they the, there's a period where they weren't producing the one fo- the one piece footboard. They start producing that again about the mid '60s as the 5000 S, um, and it's a little bit different. It doesn't have a, a leather hinge. It's actually um, it's a different a different system. You can tell that they they developed it. Um, but during this period, Camco is still manufacturing the floating actions four nine five fives for Gretsch, and you can tell this because you'll you'll see later Gretsch ones. They get the same exact changes that the Camco ones do. Again, they're just they're riding together throughout the whole the whole life cycle of the of the five thousand is Camco and Gretsch. Um, until the mid eighties, the one last stencil brand that they briefly had during this time period was Rogers. Actually Rogers sets from 1960 to 1963, you could get a, a Camco 5,000 pedal with them. It actually said Camco on there. They called it yeah. the, the deluxe and they had the, the lower priced version as well called the standard. Um, and those would be in catalogs, like a lot of the old yes. Rogers catalogs. You'd look at it and you'd see like, OK, you know, it'd be like Swivomatic hardware. And then you'd look and there'd be like a Camco hi-hat stand, right? I think it would be Camco hi-hat stand and bass drum pedal. I um, I believe they, they did have the, the Camco hi-hat. I'm not exactly sure. They also used that basic Wahlberg and Auger kind of like yeah. skeleton framed hi-hat. A lot of brands use that as their as their basic hi-hat sure. during that time period. But it only existed for three years. Camco would have made these pedals um, and, and sent them to them. And then in 63, they, they released the Swivomatic pedals. And after that, they dropped the Camco pedals to, to promote it. their own brand. Um, so that kind of covers the first era of the 5,000 pedals in, in America. Um, any questions? No. I mean, my takeaway is that like, it's just, it became such a, uh, like, like, like it was like an instant hit and then it became kind of like an industry standard where you see that with the old companies where these drum companies like Gretsch, um, for, for example, or Rogers would say like, it's cheaper for us to use this existing, um, you know, have them manufacture it and kind of like, you know, throw our logo on it and, than than them going into their own production of pedals. But I guess then like in the Rogers example, I've heard this in other episodes where like um, maybe while they were tooling up to make their own pedals, they said, let's use Camco or something. You know what I mean? Like it takes, you can't make your own pedal overnight. It it would have just been an option for them to, um, and and there could be other, other pedals as well. Remember that through the whole um, period of George way drums, obviously they, existed during a very short specific period of time they were selling a camco pedal they didn't have their own imprint with their own footboard it was probably um well it was definitely way cheaper to just get the camco version and yeah every, everything i've heard about john rashan who was the person who was in mm-hmm. charge of camco during this time period he seemed like a pretty ruthless guy you know <laughs> that's he, what he, i heard he was yeah. de- he was definitely trying to aggressively grow and expand his his company and yeah you, you can check out other episodes for for more history of that um yep. the, the history of camco um with joe luoma he, he talks about it a little bit ron Danette talks yeah. about it a little bit as well in in his episode um yeah but it it, it makes sense if you're going to speculate you you want to use 
the information available to you. So if this was the guy who was making decisions during this time period, then everything seems to to make sense. Um, yeah. And Camco, I mean, from a collectability standpoint, I think everything Camco and you have Camco drums yourself. I mean, mm-hmm. there, there's just something very collectible about Camco. Um, yeah. And I mean, they're super nice drums and everything, but like even the, the Camco 5000 pedal just seems like it's got a higher value than, um, than the rest, maybe not the Martin Fleetfoot, but, um, no, people definitely assign a premium to anything with the word Camco on it. Uh, you yeah. see a little practice pad or a snare stand or something. It's just a basic, it's nothing exactly really special, but if it says Camco on it, the price is definitely higher than, other items that are that are similar that's just the way it's been for a while and probably will yeah. be due to rare rarity primarily sure sure um so there is an interesting little branch in the 5000 tree that i, I want to mention briefly and that is a company called john gray which has been covered in in i think a few of your different episodes that cover british brands but yep. they're a british brand and from 19 19- 47 through 1967 when they were producing a lot of drum sets they had two pedals uh the 5189 autocrat and the 5210 broadway and couldn't possibly be a coincidence um the design of this pedal it is identical to a martin fleetfoot so Based on on what I've heard from some of your your other guests, it's extremely hard to enforce patent um, patent disputes in other countries. So I think what John Gray probably did was they just got a hold of one and they reverse engineered it. And it's almost identical. You could tell it wasn't made by Martin Fleetfoot, so it's not like it's a stencil brand. But um, those are great pedals, too. They have leather hinges. Um, they're, They're pretty rare as well. Um, and also, like I said, some of them are broken, but I thought that was really interesting that they, re- yes. that they, that they reverse engineered the Martin Fleetfoot and kind of just unapologetically sold it as their own. I mean, product. you're totally, you're totally right because it's, it's exactly like, um, I think Ron Danette said about, I said, Hey, what about Heyman drums with their, you know, the turret, the round lug, I mean, what about that? That was kind of a Camco thing. And he said, yeah, but it's that's probably what you're referring to is it's so hard to enforce it. And it's kind of like, well, okay, so Camco or Martin Fleetfoot, whatever, had um, that same design and they kind of did the exact same thing where they just like, you know, these Yankees made this uh, <laughs> pedal. <laughs> let's let's uh, let's take it. And um, well, it was a good design. You know. It was a good design, exactly. too. So from their perspective, they probably were focusing more on on their drum line. You have to have a pedal in there if you're going to copy one and and risk that um, risk that you might as well copy a good one. Um, so, yeah. and I think that so the cam, the eccentric cam is probably the focus of the original Martin Fleetfoot patent. The John Gray cam is probably not coincidentally a little bit different. Um, just Mm -hmm. a slightly different shape and they, they advertise that in their, um, in, in their catalog as well, but that's just an interesting little branch. It it kind of happens, you know, simultaneously, but at first I thought, you know, this must've been made by Martin Fleetfoot, but the more I looked at it, um, and, and I really like to get actual examples of these pedals. So I have at least one of all of these pedals that I, cool. I sort of collected them basically once I started the process of, of trying to figure out the timeline, I, I just went all the way in with it and put in the effort <laughs> to find the er- the early ones. But I, I have a really, yeah. a really nice autocrat. I'd have, I've not seen a Broadway available. They're probably pretty rare, but I'm sure they're, yeah, exactly. they're I'm sure they're available uh, in the UK much more readily. Sure. So in the early seventies, this is this I consider a new era for the 5000 pedal because Camco hasn't changed it much during this time period. In fact, I don't think they make any changes at all in the 70s. But if you remember from your Camco episode, Camco had some movements. So they they went from mm-hmm. Oaklawn to Chanute 
to LA and as, as things moved, the, the pedal did not change. Uh, it's still a great pedal, but it does have some issues. Um, there was a drum shop in New York called Frank Ippolito's Pro Percussion, I believe. Everyone probably just referred to it as Ippolito's, but in the early 70s, there was a guy working there named Al Duffy, and he, he is no longer with us, but he, he left a lot of really good information, and he, he left specifically um, a couple different legacies in terms of things that he invented, but he, he was the first person to, people were coming to him with these pedals, or maybe he just noticed this shortcoming that the leather stretches and breaks but when it stretches your foot after it does that a certain a certain amount the footboard is going to hit the t-screw for the for the toe clamp and that's going to make Mm -hmm. a clicking sound it's also going to damage your your footboard so his first thought was well there needs to be a chain here um so he starts modifying these pedals and and pretty pretty quickly he develops the chain the single chain and sprocket system and these pedals I've been really, uh, really looking out for. So I, I've, they're not um, terribly, terribly rare. I, I have four of them right now, pedals that were from di- various eras, but they were certainly modified at Ippolito's. Um, and he, he, had, he had the, um, the idea to... He knew it was a good enough idea or someone did there. Maybe it was Frank Ippolito, but they patented it before they started mm. doing it. So um, cool. one of the earliest ones I have um, says something similar, patent pending on it. And then later, once yeah. the patent was awarded, they actually put the patent number in there. But these ones I find extremely interesting because of the parallels to what I do myself. So it, it, it's, it's just really cool especially on the early ones to see that whoever did it, if it was Al Duffy or someone that he trained to do it actually took metal punches and punched um, various things in there. Usually it yeah. sometimes I think the ones that he did, he also punched his name in there. So I have one that actually, cool. and the cool thing about hand punching the letters is it's never going to look perfect. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it was, it was patented. Um, Elvin Jones started using it immediately and it really solved that initial problem. It was a huge improvement. The chain did not stretch and a, a nice side effect of that sprocket and chain system is that it feels really smooth compared to a, a strap drive. It's just a lot smoother of, of an action. Yeah. I've had a strap drive Ludwig pedal and it was just like, I mean, going from, I think, after that, I got like a Iron Cobra or something. And it was like, man, this is just, uh, it's, the evolution is clear. It's like, okay, this got better for a reason. Like, obviously, you, it was what they had. But um, it's just, I mean, it, but I'm sure people like them now. And, and I'm sure I would like it if it was well-maintained. But um, the, the, the chain is obviously uh, much more modern. So for people who are like maybe looking around for pedals. So if it says Ippolito's or Al Duffy, then you know you've found a super rare early pedal, right? I don't know if it's rare. There's a there's a guy who is alive and on Facebook who was part of the process. He he was trained probably by Al Duffy to produce them, and I've heard him say, maybe it was an exaggeration that he did hundreds of them. So okay, it's and um, they come to me in different states. One of them that I got had been completely worn out and I made the decision rather than keeping it as kind of like a cool relic that was completely unplayable. I just fixed it. So as the, as the next restore, I went in and built upon the the work that had already been done. And I had to swap out a few parts that were, that were worn, but um, I think there's a fair amount of them out there. If you see a Camco 5,000 or Gretsch and it has a chain drive, then you can look on there and, and usually it it will be stamped. But um, yeah, that's a pedal that was converted at Ippolito's in New York. So it's cool. cool. To, it's cool to think that they're all coming from this one location. And um, yeah, it would have been a big, 
improvement to people, people who are, are, are playing, playing the pedals. It would have been an immediate improvement. And some people do like the, the strap drive feel. Some people like the chain. But for modern pedals, people are, are used to the chain feel. Um, you could get a floor plate modification as well. That was less popular. I, I don't see too many of those. So in 1978, a couple of things happened. Al Duffy moves to Nashville to work for Pearl, I believe. Camco shuts their doors and DW, which is a small-ish company producing primarily canister thrones at that, that time, if, if I recall correctly, in the late 70s, they buy up all of the all of the Camco stuff. Um, and included in that is the pedal. And they really put a lot of work into it right away. Um, there's a good early DW piece of, of literature on Drum Archive that, that shows this, but um, they make some serious expansions. So I'm just going to go over really quickly. They had six different models. So remember, this is expanding from the three that um, were available previously. Previously, 5000C chain and sprocket, 5000CX chain and sprocket, but the sprocket is uh, cut. The original ones have a full circle, which will mess up your shoe over time. So um, that's all, all modern ones have the cut in there. But at, at first, that was like an option <laughs> you could get. Huh. Um, 5001CX, that's the chain and sprocket with with the cut sprocket and the one piece footboard um the the 5000 just regular 5000 is nylon strap 5001 nylon strap with a one piece footboard and in the mid 80s they have the 5002 which is the double pedal so chain it they're all chain and sprocket um and that's the double pedal that, that's their that's their six different models that they had sure, yeah. in the, at that time period, early '80s. It's interesting to me that the five thousand, you know, straight the five thousand is nylon strap, and the five thousand C is chain. Because you'd think that, like, I don't know, I guess nylon is good too, but I think it would be like the standard would be the chain. But I guess it's just a different time. N- not at that t- not at that time. Um, sure, there was a lot going on at that time. That's when Japanese companies first started coming up as well. And um, I'm going to try to be brief with, with some of this next information because it can get very dense. And if you want to cool. discuss it more uh, in, in the Patreon episode, we, we, can, we can do that. But um, okay. there's a lot going on during, during this time period. And a nylon strap pedal is the standard during that, that time period. Um, but there's a lot of diversification and refinement going on. They definitely did not... Um, just leave the, the, the pedal as is. And the reason they were able to produce the chain and sprocket is because uh, they DW had to also buy the patent from Ippolito. Um, and I'm not exactly sure when that happened, but it had to have been almost simultaneously because they, they were doing it, or maybe it was licensed. It, who knows what the, the, the deal actually was, but DW I think is a company that's known for really, really doing things well and properly yeah they would never right. they would never have just stolen the the idea they they absolutely um went there and bought bought the patent which was basically just him showing showing how it's done and early dw pedals you see a lot of the chain drives of varying levels of sophistication uh at one point they kind of tried to s- solder it on and then some of them are held together with pins but they um to me, what that shows is that they they were experimenting. It wasn't like, all right, you know, start mass producing these. They, they really wanted to see what they could change and improve on on the pedals. Um, so, in 1983, um, the the guy who invented the the 5002, his name is Dwayne Livingston, and he is alive and on on Facebook, and he'll he'll tell you ab- about um, you know ab- about the 5002. The early ones are very interesting looking they have three towers so it's it's a pretty primitive design but it works and it was at the time probably the only practical way to get a double pedal there was there's double pedals going all the way back into the early 19 teens um yeah that are really cool 
it's really cool to see see one that's that old um think about somebody playing slayer on it or something you know it's just like <laughs> it was a different motivation but the, the design is remarkably similar so yeah yeah but this was the first like modern this was like yes. a big step forward okay yeah for, for sure and especially because DW doesn't leave anything alone that their R and D department is, is really, really active. So the 5,002 changed a lot between then and now, if you look at a 5,002, it doesn't have three towers, you know, it has a, a, a little change in the casting. It's pretty, pretty brilliant little, um, uh, change to make to the pedal, but I'm, I'm really glad that DW, did acquire those um the rights to produce that pedal because it was definitely a good brand to carry the torch yeah yeah definitely and shout out to Dwayne livingston obviously who you've talked to a lot and i've talked to him and he's a very nice guy and um we were going to get multiple people on here but it kind of just is more streamlined to have um yeah obviously vincent kind of do the the whole the whole thing so um thank you to Dwayne. but that's awesome it's so cool that just like a guy I mean, I'm sure he was in the drum industry and everything, but kind of invented this. this yeah, super cool. Thing. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. He probably wanted, yeah. didn't, was tired of carrying around two bass drums and, and needed to play something with double bass. Um, yeah. So it's important to note too that during this time period, DW is still producing pedals for Gretsch. They're still called the Floating Action. You could get not either nylon or chain drive. Um, so so Gretsch had their own chain drive version. Um, and in, in the in the 90s, most brands are really feeling the the effect of the Japanese brands coming into the market so strong with such a strong product, and they're able to produce it cheaper. So I'm not sure when the Japanese brands started util utilizing Chinese or Taiwanese production, but most American companies also went down this path during that time period, probably because they had no choice. Um, it's very, it's a lot more expensive to manufacture parts and to assemble in the United States. Um, so DW, I believe this is just speculation. I believe made that change in two parts, which was a really good way to do it. Um, I think they probably got, they outsourced all of their parts to Taiwan or China first, had them shipped over to America, and then they were assembled and quality checked in, in their factory in Oxnard, California. So that gives you a better chance to oversee your product directly rather than outsourcing the entire process. But later on, probably early 2000s, they did move, uh, as far as I can tell, um, all of their production and assembly out of the United States. So you can, where it used to say USA on the footboard, it starts saying the drummer's choice. And, um, gotcha. I don't want to get into, um, we can talk about this in the Patreon episode a little bit if, if you'd like, but, um, there's a, a lot of speculation about this move to, to a, a more global, um, economy and things being produced in, in Taiwan or China and whether they're better or worse. Yeah. But these companies, almost certainly did not have a choice. If they wanted to continue existing, they had to follow this trend, otherwise just go sure. out of business. And so them moving the, their production to Taiwan and China. Taiwan is, um, as far as I can tell, it's pretty, it's very similar to, to America in terms of uh, like having a safe workplace, um, being fair in terms of the number of, of hours people have to work. Uh, they do get paid obviously, uh, a lot less than an American worker would get paid, but, um, the factories there are, are not, they're not less, yeah. less sophisticated than, than in that, America. Sure. It's really just, it's an efficient, cheaper way to produce your items. And if you oversee the process, there's really not too much of a, a loss in, in quality especially with DW specifically the way they did it. I never noticed. Um, most people would think, and I would think this too, that, that their, their products they're currently producing are still very good. They're, they're not, yeah. they don't have a ton of issues. Um, 
So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So Tama Camcos. Uh, most people have probably seen a Camco pedal that was made in Japan and has the, the Tama branding on it. Um, when Camco split, Tama got the the name, but they must have also either negotiated or or figured out a way to produce their own chain drive pedal. Um, I'm not exactly sure how how that would have worked, but they have their own pedal called the Six Seven Three Five, and it's very similar to the Chain Drive Five Thousand, but definitely made in their own in their own way like all the castings are are different it's it's similar but it's really just kind of a better more um streamlined heavy duty version of the camco 5000 pedal from america yeah it looks i guess thicker is not the right word but it definitely looks a little more uh beefy um kind of as you get into that like 80s ish uh pedals and hardware where everything became thicker and beefier it um it definitely has that feel i like this period too for some odd reason i didn't know about it and then like when i found out about the tama camco stuff it was just like one of those like just that's classic drum history stuff is like tama gets the name and the rights to produce the pedal of their own but like dw gets the machine yeah. stuff correct the they, machine they get all okay. the actual stuff and i believe the patents as well. So what most yeah. likely happened was if there was some kind of negotiation, which there must have been to have divided it that way, it, at some point Tomo included the right to make their own pedal using using that design. And they may have yeah. they may have just done it. But um for the nineties that was a, a pretty Tama had their own pedal and it's um the style for, for Japanese pedals at that point was definitely bigger is better. Everything was really heavy duty. Um, but they had that pedal in their, in their lineup for most of the nineties. Um, and I believe it, it went out of production maybe in the early two thousands. They did do a, a reissue recently. I'm not sure if they're still making that, but, uh, Kimco had a whole line of pedals, um, in, in, in the nineties. So, uh, the, the HP 35 is the regular Camco chain drive. They had HP 38, which is called a Camco extra light. I'm not sure what that is. I'm not sure if I've ever seen one of those. Maybe it was, um, I mean, it's in the catalog. I've, I've, I've never seen it. It probably, there was some, some kind of slight difference that, that made it more lightweight, I guess. Um, and then they had their own pedals that were kind of derivative. Um, one called the flexi flyer, the pro beat. Uh, you can just look at nineties. Tama catalogs to, to see this, but in there is the 5,000 pedal. So it's cool. At that point, you've started in, in Milwaukee, you've moved all around the United States, you've kind of gone off to England a little bit, and now you're off in Japan. And the the amount of derivative pedals that that came of that design made by Tama is uncountable. I, I still see pedals made today by big companies that are essentially just the the 5000. So it really took that design and made it um available to 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 everyone. Yeah. Can I ask um before we move on when did so DW obviously the split with Tama and DW getting the the, the Camco stuff happened in 78. Did DW pretty much instantly decide to make the like kind of iconic red plate on the bottom or was that a no. little bit later the, the, that um there's a really cool evolution of the dw pedals and and when i get further down the rabbit hole i might start collecting and documenting these because my goal cool. is to do the, the same thing i've done with speed king which is to meticulously analyze and try to map out the history of the whole timeline my plan is to do that with the 5000 pedal as well um so I'm not quite there yet, but no, the earlier one, the earlier ones did not have the red um, floor plate. It was it was more silver, and then it was black. Um, and the 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 footboards. I mean, it's it's the same as as the other other eras where things slowly start changing out. Just imagine mm -hmm. that times ten because of DW's R and D department was trying different things. And the really cool thing DW's done, and I. I thank them for this because it's make it makes repairing and restoring these pedals so easy is that modern DW parts work 
on all eras, even going back to mm. Martin Fleetfoot. So I, cool. I could put a new, a brand new Delta hinge on a Martin Fleetfoot and it will absolutely play better. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. And, and all different kinds of things. So if something broke, if you wanted something more substantial, they're, they're what I call infinitely repairable. There's enough because they're still being produced and the parts are kind of expensive, but because there's a lot of parts available and they're still being produced, you will always be able to repair your DW pedal. So that brings us into what I call the modern DW era, and that's 2000 until present. Um, and I'm going to go over quickly what models they, they still offer, to, to my best knowledge. This may be slightly um, out of date. So they've got a double chain turbo um, and a double chain accelerator. Um, I'm going to really quickly try to explain the difference between turbo and accelerator. It's, it's not easy to do, but if you imagine a turbo cam is a perfect circle, an accelerator is, um, a different shape. Um, and what that does is it, it, it changes the action, the way that the beater kind of throws towards the head and the way that it responds. It's a little bit quicker and it can also be, um, more powerful. Turbo is what most people are used to. If you are used to playing a DW turbo and you st you stepped on an accelerator, it would feel different to you probably. But turbo is is a very smooth um, action. Most people I, I know prefer that. Um, so then you've got uh, a solid footboard. Those are just accelerator. A heelless pedal, also just accelerator, and an XF, which has a longer footboard, also available um, in just accelerator. They also have, and th these are 6,000 pedals technically, but you can still get a single chain turbo um, from DW. It's a 6,000. You'll, If you look at it, you'll say that looks exactly like a 5,000. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure how they've they've done their, their numbers, but... Um, and you can get that in either single chain turbo or accelerator. And you can also, just like the really old school ones from, uh, you know, 40 years ago now, when they were developing them, you can still get a nylon strap pedal from DW. It's called a 6000 NX, if you want to look that up. Um, cool. So even though all the production is done in, in um, I would guess, Taiwan, I think a lot of people are, are looking to tie Taiwan at this point as a, a a really good option for manufacturing. Um, it may be possible that the pedals are still assembled or quality checked in Oxnard. Um, I would, you know, I would need to get that from somebody who, who was, who had firsthand um, knowledge, but sure. yeah. over, overall the quality and reputation was maintained, which is not what you can say for a, a, a lot of reissues when, or, pe no. or p p pedals that, Pedals that people liked in the past and people are still trying to make them. It's very difficult to, I think DW did a really amazing job at, at maintaining yeah. the, the, the quality and reputation of the 5,000 pedal. And it, it would have been maybe easier to discontinue and say, um, okay, let's develop a completely new pedal, which is sort of what they did with the 9,000 um, mm -hmm. in the early 2000s. But they, they really kept the 5,000 on on the map and still continue to offer parts for it so i think that was a really yeah. a really smart way to do it um, I, I agree and i i would say like in both of our lifetimes i mean it's always existed so like if you didn't tell me that like this pedal goes back to technically like the 40s um I would just think it was like an awesome kind of modern pedal. Obviously, DW did so much updating and all that, but it's never like a um, like how the Speed King came back. It was like to me, it's like a it doesn't have that like this is a vintage pedal that people still use to be like, you know, um, or Rogers new pedals. It's like it's not like a throwback. It's like a I use it because I like it sort of thing. Like I've always liked it. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, 5,000 and I don't know this, but it has to be the most popular pedal ever. Um, yeah. I just, cause I, I asked everybody for a really long time, especially at drum shows. Well, Hey, what pedal, what kind of pedal do you play? And people either said a 5,000 or a pedal that was derivative of 
the 5,000. So it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Sure. A lot of these companies, Rogers and Ludwig specifically, they have, they have their reissued pedals. So you can get a, a new Swivomatic, you can get a new Speed King. I think that the, the path that those companies have taken is they need to sort of pay homage to, to their legacy. A lot of people mm-hmm. were really upset when they took away the Speed King. And in fact, they even made a group on Facebook about it that ended up being an awesome group for all different kinds of discussions on Speed Kings. Um, but yeah, people, they, they have to offer some of these, some of these classic items. And it, I think it's really cool to do that. If you're, if you're a modern brand, you have to have your own, your own pedal. So I'm not knocking what other companies do, but what I can say is that I think DW did it in a very intelligent way. I would agree completely. Yeah. So the DW 9,000, I'll talk about very briefly. Um, it was invented by a guy named Lucas Jacobson. And I, I met him at the last Chicago show, 2019. Um, he was exhibiting, but he had the prototype there. And I, I have a, a, a funny picture of, of me holding the prototype, really excited looking at it because it's the very first 9,000 pedal. So a lot of people play 9,000 as their, their main pedal. I remember that's the pedal I played before I found Speed Kings. Um, even without knowing anything, you know, a, as a teenager, I wanted the 9,000 because it was the nicest, the nicest one. And yeah, but if you look at that pedal, it is a lot different. I mean, it's not a 5,000 pedal, um, especially the double pedal has so many changes, so many bearings. That pedal is ridiculously smooth. Um, but yeah, that was developed in 2002, I believe by Lucas Jacobson and, um, however, the, the design or the patent or licensing was transferred over to DW, you know, they, they really created that. You can view that as an extension of the 5,000 because that's probably the starting point. And then he went from there with figuring out his different mechanism and action. Yeah. Man, I remember when they came out. I mean, I was like 12, so I was pretty young, but I just remember thinking like like seeing it and it just like just the look of it, how it is just like it just looks I I mean I know it's not made of like titanium, but like um it looks so expensive and it is expensive. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's just it, like it, thinking it, it like and, this and- is like the holy grail. It's a really nice pedal. No one's going to buy a 9000 pedal very few people, let me rephrase, are going to buy a 9,000 pedal and complain about it because people will always complain about things. But it's a great pedal. It's reliable and they use the same principles. So there's a lot of parts that transfer over. But if your 9,000 pedal breaks, and I know this because I've repaired several of them, it's a lot cheaper to repair your 9,000 than it is to buy a brand new one. And, and they're infinitely repairable. Even the cast pieces, yeah. if, if you break a cast piece, it can be replaced. You know, you don't want to, there's no reason to try to weld it back together or anything. It's easier just to replace it. But um, they also make another pedal and I don't, I'll just say, I I don't really know anything about this, but they have a pedal that is, um, what's it called? Like a machine drive pedal or something. I should have done the Mm -hmm. research for this, but they, they actually make a pedal that is, is made of machined aluminum, like CNC'd uh, aluminum. And it's, it's made in the United States and it's a really nice pedal, but it's also like $900 for a single. So yeah. that's out of the reach of, yeah. of almost anyone. But if you want an example of how expensive it is to make things of, of uh, really nice materials in the United States with, with, um, with the labor and environmental regulations and all the things that, that uh, bring the price up, that that's the ultimate example, a $900 pedal. I'm sure it's great. I've never yeah. actually played one because yeah, <laughs> but I, no. I, I, I will someday. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's a very I, nice yeah. pedal. Well, and, and like before I mentioned, oh, I know it's not made of titanium. Now I remember they do make the DW 9000 titanium, which I remember seeing, I think at, yeah, a yeah. at a guitar center. I was like this pedal, like, like a regular 9,000, which, um, I've played and I have a friend who uses it and it's like, but the regular double pedal is like 650 bucks and the titanium, I mean, you see them used now for 
I mean, they're over a thousand dollars. I think that was a, so, a, a limited edition thing too. So it's I not. It's not right. only maybe that it's superior materials, but also, um, yeah, they only made maybe a certain number of them. I've seen like gold yeah. gold plated ones too. That, that's, that's one awesome. one cool thing. I haven't gone down this this path too far yet, but anything is is possible. So you could actually. Um, I could take a regular 9,000 pedal and make it completely gold plated. It would be extremely expensive to do so. But um, that's another thing that I want to look into in the future is maybe more cosmetic things. So maybe a a 9,000, but your tower is a different color other than the standard black. Um, Yeah. Cause a a lot of, a lot of people are always going to play a 9,000 or, or maybe a 5,000 pedal, but they are customizable as well in terms of, the cosmetic aspect. Yeah. People love that. There's, there's a, um, 9,002 double pedal. That's gold plated on eBay for $2,600. Um, grab it. So grab it. There you go. Dude, I, I just bought it while we're talking. Ah, <laughs> oh, man, I was about to buy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's the, the 9,000s definitely. And, and that's kind of the last, uh, really the big last in the evolution up, up till this point. Right. Yeah, th- that's the e- that's the end of my timeline because they're still producing these pedals. So it, it will go on. Um, there may be changes in the future, but probably not a lot because it started off as a good design. All of the problems over time, as we discussed by various people in the line, all of the problems were addressed. And now it's at a point where it can just sort of sustain itself. And that's why as, as a business, you... One of the big problems with Speed Kings was the eras that they produced bad ones really hurt Mm -hmm. them. And everyone will always remember that as, oh, well, Speed Kings are nice, but this. So they've they've really kind of kept up that that reputation. And and now's the now's the point where they really get to capitalize on that, where they it's super streamlined. They've got their factory overseas that's that's pumping them out to however many they need and they're they're good reliable pedals so yeah that, that's yeah. that's basically the end of the the timeline um in 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 the patreon episode there's some other stuff that i'll, I'll get into s- some more details because there's another era that i would call the derivative era and that actually i have that listed as 1960 to present so that that would cover all of the pedals that were made after the martin Fleetfoot that were designed by, you know, in, influenced by the 5,000 pedal. Sure. And there's a lot of them. I'm sure. I mean, it's sort of one of those things where once you see, if you're a, you know, a drum builder or like a manufacturer, once you see it, you can't unsee it and know that it's working. You're like, okay, well, of course it's going to influence you. This is like, yeah, you know, why, why not uh, do that? But, that's cool. Well, all right. So as we hit the end of the the timeline here, I think now is the perfect time. Um, first, I want to say a big thank you. And I should have done this earlier. Uh, and I hope I pronounced his last name right. But Kyle uh, Krasuski, who started the Vintage Drum Workshop slash Camco 5000 Pedals Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Um, and he sent me a message a long time ago um, and was just talking about it and doing the episode. And I think I said, yeah, Vincent and I have actually been talking about it for because we've been talking about this for a while, but yeah. he connected me with Dwayne and um, it just, again, super nice guy, very passionate. So everyone should go and join that Facebook group, Vintage Drum Workshop slash Camco 5000 Pedals. Um, so thank you to Kyle. But um, so Vincent, why don't we, again, tell people where they can find you because the stuff you do is just awesome and like maybe describe a little bit about, you know, what you can do for people who are, looking for an old speed king or you know beyond that other stuff you can do okay so um vitalizer for the past five years has been heavily focused on speed kings um i came up with a modification for for the speed kings which really really helps them out a lot and um it's so the the demand for speed kings especially from 2014 onwards um was really high because ludwig stopped stopped making them so they're the 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 reissued speed king is coming out now but um 
that's kind of been nice in that it's allowed me to start working on some other pedals a, a little bit. This year did end up being really busy for Speed Kings as well. But about a year ago, I started doing what I would consider the research and development for other types of pedals. Uh, the first one I did was the Speed Ludwig Speedmaster, which is another strap drive extension spring pedal. And then I moved to the 5000. I've also done um, Swivomatic, and I'm going to do a Slingerland Tempo King as well in, in the future. Um, but yeah, I'm working on all of those, all of those pedals. So similar to how Ippolito's had, had their, their shop that did repairs and modifications. I do the same thing for Speed Kings as well as 5,000 pedals. Um, and you can buy pedals off of the website, vitalizerdrums.com. And you can also send your pedals in to be repaired or modified. Um, and the, the new service introduced will be 5,000. The price is going to be cheaper than speed king because i can do them faster um mm -hmm. but uh yeah that's the that's the basic um plan for the for the business moving moving forward i i, I am gonna do um hi-hat stands and other hardware will hopefully be introduced at some point as well because i know there's a there's a demand for it um but yeah i restructured the website and the reverb store so there's always pedals in stock and ready to ship that's the biggest change from last time I talked to you That's great. before you almost always had to wait in some way in order to, to get your pedal. But what I do now is I always make time to make sure. And um, so for 5,000 pedals, you'll see I've got maybe like 10 or, or so that will be listed cool. between now and um, the first couple of weeks of, of the new year. Um, and yeah, that's great. Customer send ins continue, continue to be, really steady. I, I always thought at some point they, they would fall off a little bit, but there's, I have a lot of repeat customers and I have a lot of new customers. My advertising is almost entirely, um, word of mouth, gotten a lot of, um, a lot of business from the previous podcast as well. So good, th good, good, good. Th yeah. Thank you for that. But, um, so the service structure is, uh, a little different than it used to be. I've created some basic services, um, which are cheaper and take less time. Um, but there's also the, the same high level services relic, which I mentioned last time, which is original paint, but mirror polished yep. footboard and super, which is um, refinished paint and, and the mirror polishing any color you want. Um, I've really gotten that process a lot more streamlined. So if you want a pink uh, Camco 5000, can absolutely do that it's I, that's it's, awesome it's not it's not too too difficult and i have lots more of you know more standard colors as well cool man i think that's the way of the future is i think uh everyone loves speed kings but as you said the 5000 is is hands down probably one of the most you know played pedals in the world so for you to be taking them and um, modify them why not i mean people love that stuff down the road, I'd love to send you my old 5000 pedal, which I think is 90s, I would imagine. It says made in the USA. Um, nice. So and uh, and maybe I'll, I'll post some pictures of it. It's really it's been dusty since the day I got it. Um, I think I, tr I forget what I traded. I traded a DW practice pad kit for it. One of those, which I'm sure people know, the little one with the arms and the mm -hmm. little white pads, which I never used. Um, so I <laughs> traded that for it. Uh, probably 10 or 15 years ago. And, um, and I love the thing, but, um, yeah, this is, uh, this is an awesome episode. And again, per usual, I appreciate you taking the time and being so prepared. And what I'll do too, is link in the description. Um, I'm going to put the link to your old episode cause we keep talking about it. And, um, and again, for people, they can go to drumhistorypodcast.com and then find this episode. And then there I'll put, uh, Vincent's whole timeline. Um, so, it's going to be awesome. But uh, again, Vincent, I appreciate you doing this and uh, and taking the time to be on the show and sharing your knowledge. And, and everyone can go to vitalizerdrums.com and yep. learn more about what he's got. And um, on that note, Vincent, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Bart. I appreciate it. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.